admit all. <coughs> Hi, Julie. I can see you. <laughs> Hi, Angie. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to have you here. Richard Chen. Alan Murray. Claudia Rocho from Portugal. <coughs> Debra Holder. Giles. Julie Martin, <coughs> Jane Oakley from UK, mm -hmm. Richard Chan. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Ilgar, uh, it seems that people are still I just changed the properties here. Let me check again while people are getting in. Um, please feel free to say hello in the chat. Just checking here. So who can bypass the lobby? Everyone. So I shouldn't need to have to, I shouldn't have to be admitting people anymore. They should be able to enter. But Teams always does new things every time. So who knows? <laughs> um, if you have problem, try to say hello in the chat. If you can. Uh, and the reason is, it seems that sometimes when people join the meeting before I change the meeting properties where I say that everyone can, can join the meeting room, sometimes people don't get access to, don't get access to type in the chat. So if you want to test that, uh, what usually works is to leave and reconnect. Unfortunately, that's the only thing. OK, so we have a lot of hellos already here. Hi, everyone. Claudia, Oakley, Richard. New Jersey. Jenny from Toronto. Lucy. Alan slipped past security. Yes, I, I opened, <laughs> I had security, but then I, I changed it. I'm glad that today you had no issues, Alan, because the other day was a struggle. So uh, it's time to really start the party. Uh, we have Bruce joining from Melbourne, Australia. So thank you for joining us, everyone. I'm going to um, share my instead. In fact, my screen has been is being shared already. So I hope you can see my uh, slide there. It's the usual slide we have at the beginning. Just letting you know some rules. First one is that the meeting is being recorded. Please be advised. I hope you feel comfortable with that. Everything. Um, uh, caught on, on the video will be then later shared uh, on YouTube on a channel that we have for the meetup, the meetup group. And uh, of course, if you are new to Teams, you can use your icons. Let me just go here and try to mute someone who is. Um, it seems it went away. So if you can keep your microphones microphones turned off, it helps everyone to listen better without interferences. Um, and the cameras, if you, you, we can also turn off our cameras during Dick's presentation. I am having a little bit of trouble with my internet today. So in, I hope I don't have, uh, my connection doesn't fall, but if it does, as long as someone stays on the meeting, the meeting should, uh, the teams should be, should continue to record the meeting. And so nothing, there wouldn't be a problem. So any of us, if we have problems with anything, the internet connection or something that is not working on teams, we can leave and return. As long as someone stays on, on the meeting room, the, the session should continue to be recorded by teams. And we have these little icons to raise our hand if you want to ask a question or make a comment or just uh, type in the chat. And Vivek, who is also part of uh, the Meetup um, group organization team, 
um, it will be monitoring the, the, the chat. Okay, uh, what else? So today we have Dick Moffat. I will tell you, he, I will tell you a bit about him in just a minute. I just have a few other announcements. Next session in our meetup group will be January 27th about data validation a back door to master Excel with Nabil Murad. Both um, Richard or, or Dick Moffat uh, presenting today and Nabil presenting next time are, both of them are, are from here, from the GTA, from Toronto's uh, great area. Um, so it's, it's just, just, it was a coincidence, but it's interesting that we have had presenters from all over the world, but we are starting the, the year with local presenters. Um, we have, oh, and just to tell you a little bit about that, uh, you don't want to miss that presentation um, because Nabil, he, he wrote an entire book just about data validation. <laughs> so I'm guessing, and from the, the quality of his content on YouTube, I'm sure that we all learn a lot from him. And so just about events are happening. I've been talking about this event for a while. In fact, well, this event has been scheduled for, it will be two years <laughs> sometime soon because of the pandemic. It should have happened um, April 2019 and it's not, it's not going to happen this February. And uh, there's different modalities of tickets. And there's one free free ticket that can people can register for that free ticket and get access to some of the areas uh, in the event and contact with different. Um, uh, there's the exhibition area, so different people and different companies will be represented there. I think it's worth to take a peek. And if you are interested in listening to the presentations or attending the master classes, there's also other ticket modalities for that. Oh, and there's that discount if you want to that discount Celia dash 10%. If you are interested in, in purchasing a ticket, you can apply that code for 10% off. Uh, there's a, another event coming up soon, Power Platform Boot, ca uh, boot Camp. It's a, a worldwide event happening in different cities and um, is focused on the Power Platform tools. E, and we, there's a, a Canadian edition as well. You can check this website, Power Platform Bootcamp. I, I'm going to, in fact, let me go back. I'll put this on the chat so that you can check that later. And uh, that's it. Uh, today we, we will have Dick Moffat. You can connect with him, reach out to him in, on LinkedIn, and he will tell us uh, more ways of um, connecting with him later. You can connect with me on LinkedIn as well, um, Facebook, Instagram, all those things. Uh, and if you want to post about our event today and use this hashtag MSXLToronto, that would be great because uh, the more people know about our sessions, the better. Um, if you think they are useful to you, to you, maybe they are useful to other people as well. So feel free to, to spread the word. And uh, so that's it for now. And let's let's talk about Dick. Um, Dick, hello. How are you? You you are muted. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> I was having a choking attack. No, uh, just kidding. <laughs> I met Dick in I think 2019. Uh, I went to an interview for a job where they were asking for a VBA. Um, person and I went there but they wanted VBA not only in Excel but also access and I don't know I don't work with access I don't know anything about access unfortunately so I posted on LinkedIn uh, about that opportunity and uh, Dick ended up um, connecting at that time he, he in fact got that that job at that time so and we've been uh, in touch since then we discuss a lot of things in Excel, not only about Excel, but career, life. He's a good chatter <laughs> and a good listener and, uh, and a good friend. And at some point, we, uh, when I decided to, to step up to create the meetup group, I invited him and he's been in the organizing team since the beginning. He's always, um, it's always, very very interesting to to 
to listen to what Dick has to say because of his experience. He worked for um, as a commodity trader until up to uh, 1985, it says, I have on my cheat sheet. He will tell you better about that. And then after that, he went on to create his own company, consulting business. He is specialized in Excel, Access, PowerPoint, databases, uh, and there's probably very little that he hasn't seen or done in these uh, areas, this industry. So, Dick, enough of me talking. Well, thank you for the intro. Uh, my thank pleasure. Thank you very much. You only missed about 35 years of stuff, that's all. Okay, that's all. so if you can summarize that in one or two sentences, then we can go and uh, we are ready to, to hear what you have to teach us today. Well, it's been, uh, like you said, it's been... Actually, uh, actually, Richard, yes. she, yeah, she told me something that I didn't know about it. So, you know, it's what? good to know. What? The stuff About she just said? Engaged. Yeah. Oh. I've been around since uh, the beginning of time. That's what you mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Small world, but a good Long world. haul, yeah. So everybody else is out there. I see 48 people. So we're not quite the 198 that signed up, but that's the way the world is, I guess. Everybody is busy. Oh, wait a minute. None of us are busy. Yes, I guess some of us are busy, but some aren't. So anyway, thanks for that. You want me to get rolling then? Uh, sure. Later? Okay. Microphone and camera are yours. Thank you for the nice things that you've said uh, about me, and uh, the feeling is totally mutual. It's been a great, uh, a great uh, partnership, uh, and with you and Vivek, and and it will continue on. And you talk about you know, your kids and stuff a little bit. And I talk about my grandkids and we have and all dogs. that in common. And grand dogs, yes. I was <laughs> making sure he's not going to come running in here, this puppy. But um, so good. Let me let me roll. And, and we're looking at, uh, there's a new feature. Uh, and I use the term feature loosely that you might not be able to see my ugly face once I start presenting. Uh, but um, that's fine. You you now know what I look like. I certainly don't look like I look at a picture. I've got a whole lot of COVID hair now, and I'm I'm sort of enjoying it. So anyway, let's go and share a screen. Go ahead and see what we get here. Celia, what are you seeing? Power Query custom functions. Very very good. But we're going to spend most of this time in demo and working from this PowerPoint slide. Uh, so you don't need to see my face. Uh, I will uh, explain everything and uh, I will become visible at the end. If I ever come out, I may be small on your screen, but that's the way it is. Uh, but I used to be able to, I think, have my face and my presentation, but that seems to be a problem today. So anyway, what are we here for? We're here to talk about Power Query Custom Functions. Now, uh, the original title of this was Power Query Functions, but Power Query Functions is another story than custom functions. That was my mistake. But it's it's there's still functions in the true sense of what a function is. But let me first talk now about custom function. Let's talk about who I am. And this is sort of quickly covered by Celia, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit more. I've been an independent consultant since uh, 1985. I started out doing spreadsheets in 1983 with VisiCalc. I then uh, got into Access in 1992 uh, before it was, when it was in alpha and uh, then in beta and was a, one of the first users of Access. And I was in Access Insider for 12 years uh, uh, until they changed that program. Uh, I've been using SQL Server since 1995. I've been using Power Pivot since 2010 and um, uh, I have been using Power BI since uh, 2011, I suppose, the, when it came out. So both of those products I've been using since then. I've worked uh, for multi, multiple multinational corporations in Canada, U.S. and the Netherlands, as well as as, as England. And uh, that's probably the only uh, places I've, I've uh, countries I've worked. But I've worked for. Uh, no, I've never, I've nope. spoken Australia once, but I didn't do any work down there. Oh. But if anybody down there wants me to do some work for them, please, because I love Australia. I, I really had a wonderful 10 days in, uh, in uh, 
Sydney, basically, and its environments, environs, and it was wonderful. I've also been on multiple Microsoft councils over the years. Uh, like I said, the Access Insiders, but I'm on the VSTO uh, group and the Office Developers group when there was one. And uh, so I gave an awful lot of time for free to Microsoft for a lot of years. And it was uh, quite good because I made a lot of friends uh, there and uh, did a lot of business. Microsoft was one of my clients for many years. But uh, when you get to be my age, people retire or die or whatever and go somewhere else. And, and uh, so they're not my client anymore, but I have other clients. So that's me. Uh, and that's what I've done. So what are we going to talk about today? Usually at this point in a class, I ask who you are, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Um, custom functions. Okay. The assumptions for today is that you that I have no assumption as to what you know. And the reason is because uh, you guys could be all over the map in terms of your knowledge of this uh, of Power Query and of these uh, functions in general. So I'm going to start with the absolute baby basics. And it's a pyramid here which widens. So I'm going to spend less time on the uh, I'm going to spend more time on each segment as it gets up. That's hence the triangle. We're going to talk about the basics of functions. Uh, in general, and MS, uh, MS uh, uh, Power Query functions. I'm going to look at then how you can use face functions in Power Query as columns and how you use functions that return tables. And those are the only two types of things I use functions for, but I'm sure there's lots of people who've come up with others, but I think those are the two core functions. And then I'm going to show you a BAS file that relies totally on functions. And what is a BAS file? Uh, it was actually somebody at Microsoft in Toronto. They had a BAS file. It's a big ass spreadsheet file. Okay. And that's what I'm going to show you at the end. And I'm going to show you how it uses functions to query the internet and then uh, be a source uh, for uh, a Power BI uh, report or dashboard uh, in the cloud. And my takeaway from this, in addition to what you might learn, is I want you to be able to ask me through Celia or directly, I think we're going to put up my address. All the examples I have, I'll give to you, all my files and stuff. There's nothing secret here. Okay, every every file I have, uh, including my, my big ass file, uh, will, uh, will be available to you afterwards. Uh, at this point, I usually say any questions, but forget it. Okay, next question. What is a function? Not just a power query function, but what is a, a function? Well, a function is a special object in many pieces of software. The, 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 the fundamental definition of a function is it's a piece of code that receives multiple inputs, parameters, as we call them in Power Query. And in most cases, it's called parameters. And then it returns a result to the calling process in the form of a value or group of values or a table. That's as opposed to a, uh, a, a, um, a subroutine, for example, in VBA, where you would ask the subroutine to do something, it would do its thing, control would then flow back after that, but it would not return anything per se. It would just do something, and then you would go about partying on whatever it did in your spreadsheet for you. But the difference between a function is it returns something. And, and functions are, are, are everywhere. The most famous function in the world is equal sum, okay? Equal sum, range of cells, close bracket, oop, forgot the open bracket, that returns the values that are in those cells. So the, the function is equal sum, and the parameters are the range of cells in the spreadsheet. In SQL Server, they, they added functions uh, somewhat recently, like in the last 20 years, which for me is recent. Um, functions were not originally in, in, in SQL Server. You had stored procs would go, go out and do something for you, and then you would see the result. But functions, you have table, tabular functions, you have other types of functions in, in SQL, which, and the main thing is, again, they receive parameters, they do their thing, they return a result. In Power Pivot, you've got functions. You've got your calculate function, you've got your 
all these different functions in DAX that are built into Power Pivot and also built in, of course, into Power BI. And those are also functions in the true sense. Now in Power Query, the functions we're gonna talk about are custom query functions, I guess you would call them, but there are all kinds of functions in Power Query as well. Power Query has uh, uh, built-in uh, functions that will return things. Uh, the easiest one is what is the current date, blah, 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 what's the count of the records uh, in this uh, query, uh, things like that. Some of them take arguments and some of them don't but they all will use something that amounts to an argument in the environment, uh, some of which are just implicit in the environment and they will then return something. Now in our case, today we're talking about custom functions, which means they're queries that have been perverted into a function. I like that word perverted. It's not really a negative word. It's they've been changed. And so we're gonna talk about how you take a, a standard power query query and turn it into a function, uh, what you would do in that function, why, why you would do that and how you would use it. And again, we're gonna start at a very basic level and we're gonna work our way up. Why are there functions in Power Query? Functions are really important once you get into really serious development. And one of the biggest things, there's a bunch of reasons for using functions. And the main one, not a main one, one of the main ones is they compartmentalize repetitive tasks. Instead of building um, a, a, a piece of power query code, M code, by using the interface or writing it by hand, and then having to do the same thing again in another place by just copying and pasting that and, and using it again in another place, if you're going to do a function, a function, a process more than once, you build a function and it sits there and it then can be called from other queries or other functions inside Power Query, do their thing, receive information from the caller, do their thing and return a result back, which then can work up. They, they're also really important in Power Query and Excel in the standardization of special logic. And we're gonna talk about that. And that's a question of, of best practices, okay? There's lots of ways to, to, uh, to uh, skin a cat to, I'm sorry, I, I have had cats, so I'm just using a phrase here. I love cats, but there's ways to skin a cat using a formula but what you can do with, uh, with our custom, custom queries here is we can standardize a function which is, can be reused in different processes within your application or can be used in different workbooks. You can copy and paste it uh, and that's got lots of value. It also allows you flexible custom parameterization and that's what we're gonna be looking at today. And it allows you to build efficient hierarchical processes. I think I've got those words reversed. Hierarchical efficiency processes? Efficient hierarchical processes in Power Query so that you can, can track back what, what happened. You can, uh, you can uh, do your development. And, uh, and, and like I said, then you apply all those other things. You can compartmentalize a task, you can standardize logic, and you have flexible parameterization. Now let's talk, first of all, I wanna talk about something that came to me a few minutes ago. Let's explain something about why Power Query is so important and why you're all here and why we're here today. Power Query has, is an add-in, has basically been added to Excel over the last few years. It was added shortly after Power Pivot or around the same time. They, it and Power Pivot are the driving forces behind the data-centric Excel that we know and love today, which is why we're here now. Admittedly, I did a lot of data-centric spreadsheets. In fact, I did data-centric spreadsheets back in the Lotus 1, 2, 3 days, uh, querying DBase D, D and Informix servers and bringing data back. And But Power Query now, and then we're not talking about the big story about Power Query, but I want you to understand that it is the, the top of the food chain in Excel. You, Power Query can feed a Power Pivot data model. Power Query can feed an Excel worksheet. But it, those cannot, although a worksheet can do a little bit, a lot to, 
to provide information for Power Query, but it's not like they're feeding it per se. Power Query is talking to them and sucking information out. Power Pivot, of course, can't push up. So Power Query is the top of the food chain, all right? So now we have queries, we have custom functions, and we have functions in Power Query. Let's go for it. Let's create a starter Power Query custom function. Celia, are you seeing Excel now? I see Excel now. Good. I see things. Th you see things. <laughs> you see dead people? Oh, dead God, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe you don't know that movie, but anyway. I do. It, it wasn't. I, I was referring to that. Yeah, yes. Okay, <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is... This is my, my spreadsheet. Now, by the way, this spreadsheet is running on a virtual machine. And there may be some compatibility issues because I have, we all know that Microsoft is coming out with different versions of Excel all the time and different machines are updated at different times. We may get a message saying, oh, this isn't the current version, blah, 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 of Power Query. Don't worry about that. Uh, it's not going to affect anything we're talking about. I hope. But if worse coerce, I can I can switch to my main machine, which right now is running uh, running uh, uh, PowerPoint. So here we are in a blank spreadsheet. If we go into data, and by the way, I'm going to assume everybody knows the fundamental basics of Power Query, which is why you're here, that you would go and get data from whatever source you're going to get from. Let's what happen, see what we get when we create a blank query, all right? A blank query is just that. It's, it's, there's not much to be said for it, right? Now, you'll notice here in a blank query, there is no source. It is just a blank line here. And in the UI, it says source. Up in the left here, we go to advanced editor, and it will show us the underlying code, M code, that is behind this blank query and what, what it means is that the source is equal to zero that means there is no there is is nothing it returns nothing in fact it it doesn't return null it re it's basically a null string is what it's re returning so let me ask just tell you something that maybe you don't know in order to use power query i find and by the way everything i tell you today is i find i'm not so uh assure myself to say that I'm telling you God's honest truth. It's just I find that I need to work back and forth between the UI and the advanced editor all the time when I'm using Power Query. And in fact, to me, going back and forth is, is just super duper easy. Now, the UI, don't get me wrong, not only is Power Query the top of the food chain, but Power Query is also the most amazing piece of technology that I've ever seen in, in my years in this area. It is the greatest technology, the greatest piece of, of uh, special functioning in the Excel or even in the Access world, in the Microsoft Office world that I've ever seen. It's just an absolutely brilliant piece of technology. And the thing that's really incredible about it, other than the underlying capability, is this amazing UI that they built. And I, I, I don't know exactly who, who it was who thought of this idea, but it's just absolutely stunning the way this, this UI allows you to transform and change values and, and, and pick, uh, pick data sources and do everything you want for the 99% of the things that you would normally do by just using op uh, options in the UI. And, and, and it's astonishing because when it does something in the UI, say it does a new line item, it's actually creating M in the background. It's like a, 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 an Excel recorder, right? It's like recording VBA. But it's not the same as that. It's not at all. It's actually not recording. It's actually constructing the M code in the background based on the choices you make in, in the UI. Now, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I want you to understand that I think that is amazing. 
and the joy of it, of course, is the fact that you can have a whole string of things in, in Power Query, and you can just run them again by going data refresh all, and it will run through them all in sequence, and 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 you will get a result set. It's like a macro, and you can use a macro to refresh it by just saying refresh all, for example, is, is the way I do it 99% of the time. But the thing is, again, we're going to be working in the advanced editor quite a bit today, but we'll also be working in the UI. Let's go here and change. Some, let's make this source equals one, two, three. And I told you this is going to be basic, but it's not going to be basic for long. When I click done, this returns a value one, two, three as the result of this source. And the source is, it looks like it's just the value one, two, three, but in actual fact, it's, uh, sorry, my most missed. It's actually the response source to this process that I built between the let and the in in, in my, my query. Now, this is what a query does. It could say the source could be an external table or it could be all kinds of things. The other thing that's that you got to realize is there's all this capability to build incredible functionality between the let and the in that you can add value and change. This is the this is the secret sauce of Power Query is all the capabilities you have in here that then can be fed back to the U to to Excel uh, using this source. And by, when I say Excel, I'm focusing totally on this as an Excel uh, Power Query as opposed to a Power BI Power Query. But everything I'm showing you is going to work in, in Power BI and Excel, but I want to make sure that you see the strengths of, of Excel and its use of Power Query. So you'll see some secrets in here. So this is a query. So when I click OK, it's a query. It's ex I can name it whatever I want, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it a – I'll go with the original name. Now, I'm going to go back here, and now I'm going to make the teeny change that you need to turn this into a function. I'm going to change the source equal number. In fact, I'm just going to go number. And up here in brackets, I'm going to type greater than or equals and then a greater than symbol, which means it pushes that. And so it means here is my parameter number, and I'm going to use the number value that is passed as a parameter, and I'm going to push it back. In doing that, I'm automatically changing this to a function. And you can tell it's a function because we're in here. You have this parameter uh, UI. And if I go in here and I invoke it, I get null, all right? And that's fine. That's because I didn't tell it anything to use. So if I if I delete this invoked function that I created and go back to the original ID, if I type one, two, three here, and I go invoke, it returns one, two, three, which means my function, see how it says on vote function. I didn't, I didn't actually say it was a function. It's become a function because it has parameters at the top. And when I say parameters, I mean you could string together multiple parameters up here and pass them all to this to this uh, function at any point. And I can also tell it what I want to be in terms of what the value type of information I want to treat what's coming in as. Uh, in my, I'm not going to get into that because that's not fundamental, but it is important that you understand that the value you're passing in, if it doesn't come automatically as the right data type, then you have to tell it what data type you want to treat it as. For example, you can have a number come in, but you can say treat it as text, and then it's going to be treated as text inside your function. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about is this, is how does this function then work for me. All right. So here now, the funny thing about this is this has a, uh, a UI here, which I find kind of 
I, it's sort of interesting. I, I don't think anybody uses this interface, surely, to get data. You could conceivably uh, type in uh, values and parameters and return a result set and then copy and paste it and use it somewhere else. Instead, what I want to do is I want to use this function uh, by calling it from somewhere else. And that's where a function pays up. So I'm going to change the name of this to uh, hello. FN number. Is there somebody there? Somebody's turned their sound on? Celia, can you hear everybody, me? Everybody, yeah, yeah, I can hear you well. I think everybody else can too. At okay. least no complaints so far. But something hissy happened, so I'm, I'm just wondering. Okay. So I'm going to change the name of this to FN number. Uh, FN's my favorite phrase. I love it when they used to have an FN key on the keyboard. Um, I, I don't know. Oh, I have an FN key on my Apple Mac, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just crude. But the bottom line is typing FN is not changing anything. It's just identifying this as a function visually for your purposes. Power Query already knows it's a function. And so when I go here and I have FN number, it says FN number. It's going to look for a value and it's going to return whatever it has. So what I have to do now is create a new query. And I'm going to create another query with another blank query, just so I can show you the idea of how you would use this. Now, this is how this works. If I have FN number, you notice how it comes up on my list. I can now pass it the one, two, three here inside this new query that I created. So this query is not a function. It does not have any parameters at the top, but you can call a function from a function and so on and so on. There's no limitations on how you do that. But in this particular example, I'm gonna call this function, which is called F number. And by the way, everything is, um, you gotta spell it right. So I gotta type F and number. And the other thing is, as we know, and we've learned the hard way, and it's actually a good thing, uh, Power Query is case sensitive. So watch what happens when I save this and I go okie dokie. Now watch what happens when I run, run this query. Look what it returned. It returned one, two, three. Now query only has this in it. So if I go four, five, six and I go done, now it says four, five, six. So here's what's happened. Our friend query one, which I'm actually going to call uh, query, query get data. Again, I can call it whatever I want. Naming it has no impact on the functionality. This query then is saying go to FN number and use 456. And then once it goes to FN number, it will use this thing to bring in the parameter and return it. Now, you can say, Dick, I know that. Everybody knows that. That's not true. I'm sorry. And like I said before and many times, if you come here and you don't learn anything, you should feel proud of yourself because it means you already know it. But the point is that, that functions, the main reason I'm doing this is to show you that functions in Power Query are not, not as extraordinarily complex or bizarre as you might think if you, for example, uh, use a, a, a Git data folder and you get all these queries and functions showing up that are wonderfully created by the Power Query UI. But at the basic level, when I'm in a grow your own function basic, which is most of what I'm in, this is how that works. What time is it? Good, right on time. Now let's look at one, let's go back here. So here's what we've done is we created a query. We created a, a blank query, put a simple query in there. We turned it into a function. We use those parameters in the UI. Then we called that function from a, a query. Now, I'm gonna show you one thing here. Now this is, this is I'm gonna now go close and load and this it pulls this data back to here. So what has happened is it's actually created a table that's based on our query, which is you calling the function and passing it a value. 
Now I'm going to go and do something. Now this is not directly rated, related to um, um, to uh, um, custom functions. Although it is related to custom functions, but it's not something that I really feel is 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 fundamental. But it's a really important thing that you should learn. It's probably the most important thing you should learn about how to use Power Query in Excel. It's a special way to link your process directly to your workbook. So this is, you could say this is an aside, but it isn't really. You see this here, I have a, I don't have to have a label and above the number, but I have a number here in my spreadsheet. I want this number here to come back here. And then when I change this number, I want to see the results show up here automatically. So that rather than the, the, the four, five, six being hard coded into my, my power query, I want to actually suck it out of the spreadsheet and pass it. In order to do that, I have to create a special table. Now, this is very complexly explained in various places. I learned this from Ken Poles. Thank you, Ken, if you're out there. Uh, much appreciated, long time ago. But it's a very simple process, actually. And it's one of these things where you don't ask why, just learn how to do it. Once I've created this table, which consists of just one cell in this, or you could do this with multiple cells, but right now I'm only using one cell, the KISS principle. When I click on that value, for some reason, I go drill down. Now, don't ask me why. I don't know why. I don't care why. Because what I've now done is I've created a variable which is, uh, I'm gonna call it var number, which consists of the value in this cell. Now, unfortunately, I am uh, i didn't wanna do this. I'm just going to only create a connection and publish it up there for now. Now, what I've got now is 678. If I go back up into the queries, and I call this, I open this up, you'll notice something. This is called query get data. This is called var number. And it consists of the value 678. So if I go into get data now, and I go into my advanced editor, and I type the, the phrase var number, just var number, what I'm doing is I'm taking the var number drilled down single value query, and whatever the value is of that query, I want to push it into this, this spot in my get data, which will then pass that on to my, uh, my uh, uh, function. So let's go see here now. Let's go in here and uh, uh, drop this data. Existing contracts, okay, function, get data, open, and put it into a table. Look at, there's my 678. Now watch what happens here if I type 777 and go data refresh all, that changed this to 777. Now, this is not fundamental to how you use a function, but it's something that as an Excel user, you can use all the time. And a variation on this can be done in Power BI, but it's super easy in an Excel model. And the other thing about it is that it means that this value can be comp calculated all kinds of ways in Excel to return to be then subsequently used in whatever you want in Power Query. And when you hit refresh all, sorry, it, it, re it reflects that in the result of the query get data. Now, that is the fundamentals. Let's quickly look at this again. We had, we created a function that is asking for a number that is called by from query get data. And query get data then is using the value that I type in this cell here, which is the source of var number passing, it's opening it, passing it to the function, bringing it back, and then dropping the result here. Now, one of the real strengths of this is something that I showed you before. I'm just about done, and I'm going to move on from this to the next stage, is that 
the really strongest thing about all of this is this sounds very sam simple. But in actual fact, every single one of these queries and functions, and even this here, are have the, all the full functionality of any um, uh, any Power Query uh, query. So in this case, my, I'm taking the source as this, and it, it it changed the data type for me automatically. Now I don't really need that, but it's an example of the kinds of things that. Power Query does, and you can do inside any function and any query. Okay, so let's close this and let's throw it away. Ah, I guess I better save it just for just in case somebody asks me a question about it. Okay, now let's close it. Now the second thing on my list, if I come back here, is using a custom function as a column. So remember I said there's two things I'm gonna do with custom functions. And the time is good, I'm right on schedule. What we wanna do is, is open a file which is called custom function. And I'm, so here there's two things. One is that we have uh, the, the biggest, most traditional ability to use Power Query is to bring in data sets from SQL or Excel or whatever. But in this particular case, we're going to use Power Query at the row level in a table. And we're going to use a function to do that, which means we can use this to produce custom columns in any table we want. So let's go and look at what we want here. What I want is a new column. If I have an item and I have a price of 123 and a cost of 100, I want to see my extended sale value and my extended cost value here. So this would be 123 and 100. This, however, would be 11 times 12, and this would be 11 times eight, and blah, blah, blah. And over here, we would then have the gross margin. So you could easily do it here in Excel, no question about it, right? That's the classic, right? Boom, and you could then copy this down. And there's no question that all of this can be done in Excel, and we've all done this traditionally forever. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing this. But I'm going to show you how to do this in Power Query using a function, which gives you two things. One is it, 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 it takes the logic of the formula out of the UI. So you don't see the formula. All you see is a happy result in each row. Second thing, if the function that you're doing in this field or column, as they call it, in, in, Power, in, in Excel, is complicated, you can actually do that. You can have a function that brings in data from all over the place, things like calculating uh, GST. Now, it, it's actually in Canada, we have a, VAR, a VAT tax. Everybody out, out there knows a VAT tax. In Canada, we started with a, a, a GST, which was a goods and services tax, but we being Canadians and, uh, and what is it? What are we, um, uh, not, we're, um, passively aggressive. It was affectionately known as the gouging and screwing tax. So it was an add add on tax that you had to pay at the at the point of sale to pay the government to help it waste its waste your money. And now you could use this to calculate the HST on, on on or GST. It became the HST. But that the VAT can be calculated either here in a formula or we can go and do it in Power Query. So let's go into Power Query. Let's go and open ourselves uh, another blank query. And let's go into the editor. Now, what we want this to be, let's, let's close this and discard that change. And let's call this FN Ext Price. And let's open it again. Now, we want to turn this into a function. So what is the X price going to be? It's going to be the price of that row times the uh, items of that row. And because we're going to make a function out of this, we're going to pass price, comma, items. And then we're going to use that equal greater than 
which is just the syntax that you have to do no space, just that. And let's type price correctly and let's go done. Okay, we're good. Now, now it has a parameter of price and items. And so if I type one and I type one, two, three, and I go invoke, it returns one, two, three. If I go back and do it again with the next row, which I believe was what, 11 and 12. So I go 11 and 12 and I invoke it. It comes out to one, two, three as well, which is just a coincidence that 11 times 12 is also one, two, three, but don't worry about that. But hello? One, three, two. <laughs> one, three, two, right. So it is different, right. But it looks the same when you're in a hurry. Now, you're right, thank you, good catch. So what we've created here, and I hope I'm not going too fast, but I'm gonna be repeating this throughout. And again, you're gonna get all the code when it's over. I've created a function that is ready to take the price and the items and return the price times the item. And in this case, I called it F and X price because it's, uh, it's gonna be used specifically to cry, cry, calculate the extended price. Let's close and load this back here. And now we have to do something to this table. We have to make this table an object in its own right up in Power Query. Now, I kind of did that kind of fast. What I did was I selected this table here and I went data from table. So as opposed to pulling from whatever data source, it will work exactly the same regardless of the data source. In this case, I just have a very simple Excel table for my example purposes, and I chose from table. And if I go into the Power Query connections and queries, I see this table. Now let's see how easy this is. Now, again, I wanna add something here. If you've been working like me in Excel for, for decades, well, or years in most people's cases, I find that Excel is a magical product because a lot of the functionality is intuitive. Now you could say, well, it's intuitive because I know it. Yeah, you could make that argument. I think it's pretty intuitive. I find that a lot of stuff in Power Query is not intuitive, not because it's a problem, it's just because it's just a function that cannot really be expressed intuitively. So there is a certain amount of rote knowledge that you have to do. But again, once you learn these basic things, then you just use them over and over again and it becomes easier. And this particular one is, 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 is something you will never figure out on your own, but it's actually very easy. I'm in this table here now, and it's the exact same table that's in Excel. I go here and I choose add a column. I wanna add a column to this table and I wanna invoke a custom function for that column or field. And I'm gonna call this ext uh, sale. And here we go. I can pick from any number of functions in here, but I'm gonna choose function ext priced. Now this is cool. This says you want to use an item from the spreadsheet. I wanna use price. Now I could type a value in, or I can choose another column name and that is items. And so when I click okay on this, it adds a new field. There's the one, two, three, there's the one, three, two. And there they are inside the table calculated by this function here. So if we go back up to advanced editor, um, the, 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 oh, by the way, I wanna tell you something here that's kind of amusing. It all depends on, on who you are and how anal you are. Um, whenever you connect a table, when you open it into Power Query, it by default defines the fields of each each field in the table or each column, and it tells it it's a text or it's date time or whatever. That is really not necessary because it will do it in, in inherently for you. Uh, you can leave that in, but the reason for not having it is if I add a new column uh, in the spreadsheet, 
uh, it's going to never come in because it's going to only be looking for those columns. I want to bring in all columns, and we'll see another example of that later. Now, now it invokes the custom function, to add column, and this is the secret here. It says for each row in the source, in change type, right? It will pass the price and the items. In fact, I got because I made a change here, I have to change this to source, excuse me. And now it will take the source, which is the table, and it will pass that the, the price and the item for each row into that function and return the value back and then push it back. But let's do something better. You notice how I did that and had to edit it here in um, in 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 um, um, boop, boop, boop. in the UI in the advanced editor. If I'm in the UI and I remove that row, it does exactly it does what I want, but it does it for me. It automatically took the source and punched it into here. So if you're going to make deletions within your list of procedures in, in Power Query, you're better to change them in by editing the, them out, by deleting them in the UI. So if I go here now, I get the same result, okay? Now let's look at another, let's quickly create another one. Now let me check the time. Sorry, I should have it more visible, 624, and good. There's a funny thing about doing presentations, people. I'm used to doing presentations at conferences all over the world where somebody else is coming in after me and I'm only supposed to, and I have to be finished at 10 to five or 10 to six or whatever. So that the next person can come in. We can technically go on and on forever, although I'm not going to, but it's nice that I could add a little five minutes if it goes long. And uh, even though some of you guys in the far away will fall asleep, I don't have to worry about that. It makes me happy. So anyway, what we're looking at here then, if I come in here, is I have my extended sale. So let's create another function. All right. So we're going to go uh, do, 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 new, come on, new blank query. And it's going to say at the top, I want to bring in uh cost, comma, items. And I want to go equals that. And then I want to go cost times items. So this is going to bring in my cost value that my calling table is going to ask me for. It's going to use the value of the cost field in every row in the table and the items to come up with what is going to be called F and extended cost, X cost. And if I go back to table and I go off to the right, I don't have to go off to the right, but just to show you, I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna add a column. I'm gonna invoke a custom function. And this is gonna be called X cost. And its function query is gonna be at function X cost. And it's going to use column name, uh, cost and column name items. So it's going to calculate my cost per item sold, my COGS, which is, of course, not everything, but it's just the cost of goods sold, the raw cost of goods sold. And so now it's showing me to see that's, uh, that's 123 and that's 100. But let's do something first. Let's close and load this and see what happens back here in the spreadsheet. Remember, I created that original table, which is here's the original table. And now on this sheet, there was I have extended when I created by uh, the, the query, the original table query, by default, it dropped it into the spreadsheet. It doesn't You don't have to go with that, but it did. And so now every time I change something and refresh this, it's going to. So, for example, change this to 100 items. And I go back here and go refresh all. Now this is 100 times 23. So it's 1,200,300 and this is 10,000. But you know what's the cool thing about this is there's no formula there. Now, 
you could say, well, why is that important? Well, it's important if you give this to somebody who's who's who stomps all over formulas on a regular basis. Uh, and we all know those people. And it's often ourselves by accident, right? This way, the logic of the formula that's used in this column is invisible to the user unless they're really capable of going into Power Query and, and looking at it. But you can use protection so that they can't get up into Power Query. And, and, and if anybody goes in and checks and changes it at the Power Query level at your client or at your company, just fire them. That's simple as that. But the bottom line is, if I go like this and I delete this and then I refresh it again, it all comes back. And it is based on this data pushed up to this table and these two uh, items are on there. Now, let me go back up here again and do the last quickly before we go to the next step. I'm gonna go to queries again and I'm gonna go new query, other source, blank query again. And this one is gonna take, it's gonna say uh, X sale minus X cost. And I'm gonna create up here X sale, which is the first parameter and X cost, which is my second parameter. And I'm gonna equals greater than and so what it means that this is now going to be a query that receives these two parameters, subtracts them from one from to other, and returns the value back. Okay, and we're going to call this FN GM, gross margin. And again, I go back to the same table. I say add a column, invoke custom column. And this one's going to be GM is going to be the name of this column. And it's going to use F and GM. It's going to use items. Nope. It's going to use sales. And it's going to use extended cost. So it's so it's it's used the functions to come up with the result. And now it's using another function that is going to use the results of those functions. So this is $2,300. So this is 12,300 and this is 10,000. So the gross margin is 2,300, blah, blah, blah. We go back to our sheet here. And once it's finished calculating, there's our gross margin and our extended cost and our et cetera. Now, this is usually where the audience goes, ooh, but there isn't an audience that would sound. So I'm okay with that. But anybody want to go, ooh, please do. But uh, oh, thank you. Okay, go away now. Okay, thank you very much. That worked. Oh, it sounds like Halloween. But anyway, what we've got here is a very important capability of Power Query, and it depends on functions. Now, you don't need to use functions, by the way. I, I want to explain that. Up here in Power Query, I could just have build a formula in Power Query that says, instead of running this, I just want to take X sale minus X cost. And it would do the exact same thing. And you're saying, and that way it would, again, calculate the gross margin for every row. The only reason you would use this function is because it's called for good order's sake, for best practices. If I want to calculate cost, I can just use the cost function. If I want a price, I can just use the price function. Now, these two maybe are a little simplistic to go to that much trouble. But I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I was talking with Celia about something she did where there was a whole bunch of columns in the spreadsheet that did special calculations uh, for various taxes and things within a payroll, right? And so and when you get your, your paycheck, as opposed to me, I never get a paycheck, I get a check. You would have all these deductions and stuff. You could have a function to calculate every the deductions for that person in every in the row of their payroll calculation every month. That would be a perfect use for these custom functions, as opposed to going back and building it in a model uh, in, 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 your, in your spreadsheet by going equals this times that minus this minus that. It, it's it's one, it's easier, and two, it's more accurate. 
it, and it's consistent. So you're always going to have the same calculation every time you use that function. If you grab it and move it over to another model, it's doing the same. So it's it's best practices. It's good order to use this kind of function. So let's save this and let's move on to the next type of function. Uh, finished. There's already a finished. Okay. I assumed the worst. So anyway, let's go to the next stage. Let's go back here. Now, let's go to the next stage. Now we're using a custom function to retrieve table data. Now, let's open a file here called regions file. Now, if you're using Power Query, you're always bringing in tables, right? So uh, let me copy this to the clipboard, for example. If I go, I hope you guys don't hear that pounding up there. That's my grandsons playing with their dog. I told their mother maybe they should be quiet, but they might not be. Sorry. I hope it's not too loud. So anyway, if I go up here and I say uh, data, get data from a workbook, all right, in this case. And again, you can pull it from anything. And I'm going to open the workbook Midwest. Now, Midwest is an Excel file that is in a folder that has these Midwest, North, South, and West. Really important point here, all of these files are exactly the same. But to start with, I don't care. I'm going to pull one of these in, and here's our data for this dummy data, right? For Furlu Corporation and Gutawa Corporation. And let's go transform data and have a look at this. In Power Query, Come on, baby. Good run time here. In, in Power Query now, I have this table. Now, source item, change type. Here's our friend change type again, which actually is defining. I'm going to just get rid of it because I don't need it. So let's get rid of it because it just clogs things up. Now, by the way, that's really an important capability to change type. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you're going to do that often, but you don't have, you don't do it automatically or you can, I guess, if you want, but you're very often going to want to clean up date dates. Uh, there's a default function that you'll see in a, a few minutes, any, which is any type of data. You really don't want that in Power Query. You want to say it's, I want this to be a date or I want this to be a whole number or whatever, but that's, that's for another day. I brought in this table here and let's look at the code. Okay, so I'm opening a workbook, and it opened the file like this, which is called C users, blah, blah, blah. Now, let me copy this to the clipboard by going Control X. Now, I've got that up in my clipboard. That was the path to the file that I just opened. And let's type in instead the word file name here. And up in this Top section, I'm going to call file name. And remember, it's KA sensitive. I'm going to call file name as a parameter, which I'm going to pass into this, which is going to become a function. And it's going to use file name to open my contents. So if I go OK on that, and now if I paste what I copied to the clipboard, which is the whole path to this file, and I invoke it, it returned me with Midwest data. Yay, and it says invoke function. So let me delete this because that's my result set. And let's look at this again. So let's paste this in and let's choose uh, just West, I think is on the list. And this is West, so the region is West. So you see what I did and I know I, I'm doing it faster because you guys know the fundamentals. I'm assuming you know the fundamentals and I, I'm afraid some of you may fall asleep because uh, it is late or early, whatever. Bottom line is now in this table, in this function, which is called table one. So let's change it to function get files data, get file data, let's call it. And again, the naming has nothing to do with the functionality, but damn it, it helps a lot when you go and look at it six months later and you haven't 
and you haven't looked at it in six months and you go, what did I do, right? And that's again where, where functions uh, uh, will come in handy because they will help drive you through the code that you wrote as you're trying to look like a professional. Uh, now, I have now got my function called function get data. And on its own, it's kind of useless because I, I could type in whatever I want as a file name and it would return a value. But let's see how we're gonna use this. Now, remember how, again, we, um, we want to add a column. Remember how we added a column before in our uh, our um, table? Okay, now what we want to do is make this table also a query up in our query, a table. And here it is as a table. And you will have seen this, I'm sure, in, at various times. This is a table which has a uh, a, a path to a data source. Now I want to add a column and I want to invoke a custom function again, get file data. And I'm going to call this file name just for argument's sake. It's going to take the file name field, pass it to our friend here, which is, which I misspelled by the way. I, I, I put two L's in there, but that doesn't matter. In fact, what happened here? Okay, let's go back and let's change the name of this. Edit to file one file data, fine. And let's go back to this and invoke a custom column, get file data, file name. There we go. Now, what's happened is this table is exactly the same. I added using that function, a new field, which is exactly the same as I did before in my uh, previous table, where all I was gonna do is calculate the extension by row. But in this case, our function takes this value in file name, passes it through the function, which is called function get file data, and then it returns a table. Now this is again, one of those things in Power Query, which I remember looking at it, going, what the heck is this? And, and you go, well, there, it's not real obvious what's happened. But what has happened is, is it's made a link to this table. So it's created, the, the original table still has four rows and there is a field that, can, that inside of it, I don't know how you describe it better, is the actual table. Now, it's a one-to-many relationship keyed to the file name that it automatically created. So this is the one side table. Up in here, you have an, an icon, which if I click on it, allows me to pick the fields I want to include from this subordinate table. I go, okay, and look what happens. This original one side table expands the name and the file name and it gets repeated as many rows as there is data in the subordinate table, which is each of these files. And the evidence of that fact is that when I pull down region here, it shows the two regions. In fact, it says load more. It shows the four regions that are included in that original table. Now, if I go back and close and load by default, it will create a new table in the spreadsheet, which is okay. And in fact, I'm gonna go close and load two, and I'm gonna select what I wanna do with this data. In this case, I wanna use this as a table, and I want it in a new worksheet. Now, what's, what's kind of neat about this is I could only create connection, and that way it would not be in the spreadsheet, it would not be in the data model, it would just be a connection. And then I could talk to that connection from another Power Query query, and then it could come in and I can do other things to the data that I get returned, and then re say publish that resulting data. A perfect example is you would use the function to get your raw data, and then you would use a query upstream from it to do an aggregation so that you, in effect, like a pivot table, you're saying, I only want it by, by state and by city. 
right? And I only want the sales and the items or whatever, right? I don't want all these fields. And I want you to aggregate them. So if there's multiple records for a given city, it will add them together. And then you, that's what you would do. In this case, I'm going to go table and I'm going to go okay. And it's dumped our data into a new table. For some reason in the VM here, control down doesn't work. But here's our data and here's Midwest, North, South, et cetera. And here's our original table. So we used a table of names to produce this result. Now, in this particular case, I admit it, there is a basic function in Power Query where you can actually go and you can, you can go data, get data, uh, file from folder, and it will return all the files in that folder, and you can sort of fine tune it as to which type of files you want. In this case, and this is sort of what I like because I like control, I'm only interested in these four files from that folder. If there are other files in that folder, I don't care. If for some reason somebody decides to create a new file, all I do is add it to this table. So I would say this is north, south. I'm going to go, of course, east. And if there is an extra table in there called east, it will find it. So if I added a region, I can add it here in this table, and it will automatically be picked up if the file exists. If I reorganize my business, and now my files are, are named after a whole different regional set, Say, for example, you merge the US operation and the Canadian operation, which has been known to happen, and you got new, new regions that you want to add in. But you this way you can make sure that you get exactly what you want, not exactly what's in that folder. So two things happen. One is you'll get an error if a file isn't there. Second of all, you get an error if the file is not conforming to the standard. And second of all, you will make sure that you get that all the files are present and accounted for when you when you bring them in. And that has a positive effect. One good example would be to bring in a stuff like a field that says, when was this created? So you could, for example, go and see how, how recently this file was refreshed it is a perfect example of how you might want to analyze that. And so that is how you would use a table to feed a function with names of files, which would then return those files. But there's an interesting thing to note here, and this is fascinating. If I look at this code here, this here fascinates me. This says add a column and it says each get file file name. This is a really simple syntax. It's just like any each loop in, in for example, for each in VBA, for example. But it's really easy. It says for each file name, which is the file name in the source, you see how this is, which started with source and rolled up to change type and then became this line. It's passing each row in, and it not only returns the data, but it automatically adds the data to this table. And it's embedded in the table in a one-to-many relationship, which you could then expand automatically. This is brilliant. It's just absolutely brilliant. And we did it 90% of it with the UI. But again, there's a mix of UI and not properties and the advanced editor to make this work for you. So that's the second part. Now, I'm going to save this. The third, the second part, which is one is columns uh, uh, used to do calculations in a row context. And the other one is tables uh, how you would bring in tables of data uh, using a function. Remember, if you could conceivably just pass one name in. And then when you bring that file up, you could in, you could just pass one name and the joy of it is in the function, you could add a whole bunch of K 
capability, a bunch of math calculations to do torture to that data and then return that resulted tortured data back to the caller. It doesn't have to be tied to a specific uh, 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 table, but it works this way. Now, at this point, usually I'd ask questions, but uh, I, th I, 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 th I think I'll just carry on because I think we're doing pretty good time-wise. Yeah, we're good. A few more minutes, not long. Um, I'm going to try something here. Now, remember I said I've got a difference between my my uh, browse, my VM and my native machine. Uh, we'll see whether this turns into a problem. If it does, I'll I'll improvise my way through it. Although it might be hard to do the old line that when you know whatever happens, act as if it was act as if it was supposed to happen. Okay, here's the BAS file. So this is an example of functions used applied. Okay, and this file is COVID master. Okay, so it is a file of COVID data. It's run every day since early March, and it uses custom functions to suck data from websites, and then it publishes that data from Excel to Power BI automatically. And in fact, the result of this file is here. This is a Power BI report which was last refreshed this afternoon. Of course, I tested it. And it has all kinds of interesting stuff in it, like the uh, deaths and by country. Here's by province. So I could pick countries that have states and provinces. Here's a query. Here's a result a report, a chart that lets me see the actual seven-day moving average new infections. So if I add the US to this, it sort of changes the chart a little bit. Oops, here's Canada and Mexico down here. But I can go and, for example, I can choose Canada and I can say, okay, what was the total for Alberta and British Columbia, which is our two Western provinces? This is what they've done in the last day. And there, here it is January 18th, which is yesterday. That trend is, is not bad. Now, I if I, I'll go one more over. I also have new cases by date and region, which I think is a nice looking chart, if nothing else. I have total cases. And then also I have a calculation, which is the cases as a percent of population, deaths as percent of population, blah, blah, blah. And every single part of this is brought from Excel, an Excel file, which uses uh, functions to summarize the data. Now, how friend says, how did my seminar go? Well, sorry, it's not over. So there you go. So here's what's happening here. I'm not going to have a lot of time to show you this. So here, here's the idea. Well, no, I want to come back to this. Let me go back. Let me show you it and we'll see what it, okay. Here's the file. This is funny. I said, I survived coronavirus 2020. I hope. Well, guess what? We're now into 2021. Who would have thought? Okay. Now, I want everybody, I want to take a break here now. I hope nobody's sensitive about COVID, you know, I mean, but we got to have a light, some lightness in the world. Um, if you want to, you can turn on your microphones for a few seconds. Some of you turn on your microphones because I want to hear you when I tell you this joke. Uh, you know, last Christmas, uh, Santa, Santa's workshop uh, was was a little late in producing its uh, its uh, its stuff for Christmas. It was because a lot of their workers were in elf isolation. <laughs> All right, and there's there's another one that there's a pirate version of COVID now. Right, only pirates get it, but they can't go swashbuckling because they have to be in quarantine because it has a high R value. <laughs> okay, thank you. Somebody's laughing. Turn off your microphones now. Go away. Um, yeah, now, I, I, you see, we can even have humor about this. I hope I didn't offend anybody's sensibilities. But anyway, I thought they were funny. So now that we've had that uh, seventh inning stretch, I'm going to show you what this file does. This file has a table in it, which consists of 
238,855 records. Now think about it. This is Excel. This is a table. And what this table is, let me see what time it is again. Okay, we're good. This table consists of the results of four files on this GitHub website, which is pulling data from, um, oh, it's loaded twice. That's why I'm, I'm impatient. Okay, uh, no, let's do this again. Let's open it again. This data comes from John Hopkins and is summarized by CSSE, I don't know who it is, but it took me four different hits to find the data I want that would actually uh, do the job for me and keep working. I had several sources that uh, that worked, but they they died. They stopped using. They stopped doing them after uh, three weeks or four weeks for some reason. Also, those were all formatted differently. But that was no problem. I was very easy to change my source by using a by changing a function to conform and transform the data in my new source to the same format as my original source, which then passed up into my spreadsheet and then went out the door to be shown in my Power BI report. I, cha I didn't change Power BI. I didn't change my model. I just changed the functions at the baseline. And so here's an example. Here's global deaths, all right? And if I open this file, it's kind of fascinating. Now, I'm going to run through this fast. I mean, this is, I have to do a, I have to show off a little bit, you know, uh, plus also I, for all you guys who the first part was, was boring. Um, I want to show you this because I think this is special. This is the data. And this is a really classic, stupid example of data. You notice how the dates are across the top of the table. So if I, if I, I have to uh, find how to get to the bottom here. Yeah. Okay. If I scroll across. You'll notice that the dates are scrolling across the top. So I have a classic cross tabular layout in the source data. So when I bring this in, I, of course, have the country and I have latitude and longitude, what I don't want. I have province and state where available, which is an issue. But the main thing is I have the deaths per the, the accumulative deaths. This is the, the every day it goes up you know, if there's new deaths in this source file. And I have another source file here, which is recovered. And another one is confirmed, which is uh, cases, basically, right? And these two files I discovered had the same exact layout. So let's go see what I did to them. So if I go back in here and I go data, okay, first of all, I created a table in Excel, which has the path to those two URLs. And I have a data type saying this is confirmed and this is deaths because I want my data to come in and I want to identify the first set of records as confirmed and the second is deaths. Then I want to pull data from these two files using that same trick I just showed you basically. But then it gets interesting. So if I go in here and I go queries and connections, here's my data. I have a function. I have a I created a query called get data. And in get data, it returns all the data from those two tables. And how does it do it? It has, it brings in the table URLs, which is the same as that table I did before. Now, this is something I think you talked about this. I wish I could go back to Excel without having to close Power Query, right, Celia? But th this is the table called uh, table URLs. So if I go here, it opens table URLs. And it passes each URL from that table into a function called F and get URL. Now, what the heck is F and get URL? F and get URL is right next to it. And it is. Oh, no, I didn't select it. Let's select. F and get URL. Okay, here it is. It has a function. And let's go into the advanced editor and see what it is. It is looking for the URL name, which is passed from the parent. And it punches this in here. And instead of looking for a 
Excel file as last time, it's looking for web contents of the URL. Now, in this case, we're, we're lucky because the web contents is a CSV file. All it is is a CSV file. But if you could talk, you could hit a frame inside of a, of a file. Uh, you could hit the XML inside a file, a, a web page. There, everybody knows different ways to suck data out of the source. In this case, all it really is is like an FTP site in a, in a sense but it's actually a URL, which has CSV files, which I bring in. But this is the interesting thing about it. One of the things that's fascinating is when you go and create a function, you don't get the, uh, the subordinate uh, uh, options here. So let's go and look in here at what I did and look at M code. The first thing I did is I promoted the headers because in our table, I wanted to promote the headers because it brings in a CSV file. It doesn't have headers by default. So I promote the dates and, and the headers. Then I remove latitude and longitude. And I did all of this in the UI. You do it, you build this in the UI by turning it, by building it as a function and getting, getting rid of uh, th this so that you can then edit using the UI. You can do most of these functions. But in this case, I'm showing you the, 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 um, the M code. Then I want to unpivot all columns except province and state, region and country, attribute. And oh, a region and country. And I want attribute and value to be the two columns that are vertical of data. Then I want to transform the column states. I want to make sure my attribute is a date and my value is this inherent value for a number. Then I want to rename columns. So look how nice this is. I promoted headers, that's what it put in there. I didn't type that, Power Query did. Then it removed columns, then it unpivoted other columns. Now, the important thing when you, when you import a data here, you see how I imported this URL? There's one thing I gotta tell you. By default, when you create this, it has the number of columns in the source file that it finds baked into the opening of this file. What's the problem with that? Of course, if I could hear you, I could ask you, but you can't tell me. Problem with that is next week, there'll be 54. Next week, there'll be 55. In our, our case, we're looking at 365 rows, right? Because there's this is about the 365 day, fifth day since I started to collect this, since the data started showing up in, in, in files. So happy anniversary, everybody. Sorry. But the point is what you want to do is not have that in here. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cancel this and discard it in case I did a bad thing. But the bottom line is I don't want to have, I just don't, these are all named uh, parameters uh, within this uh, get document, csv.document. And so I just get rid of that. It's not, it's not that they're just in, in random order. So if I go done now, so every time I run this, it's going to take my list, pass it to the URL, the URL is going to play with my data, return it back partially cleaned up so that my source looks like this. When I click on source here, it looks like this. Then I add a column table, and then I expand that column, and then I filter the columns, and then I change the data types and replace the value room error. And then this is the coolest thing at the end. I grouped them. Therefore, I summarized my data. So I took what was actually like a million records and turned it into 200 to 100,000 records, which is pretty cool because this had data right down to the latitude and longitude of every site in a country. So the United States, it wasn't just by by country and state, it was by city and then spots within each city. And so I'm going, no, 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 I don't need that much detail, right? So I'm just aggregating the totals. What's nice about it is it was all adds up. 
right? There was, if you looked at uh, all of those values, the total for the United States was the total of all of those records. It didn't have a total for the United States and then a total for every level. It just is the raw totals and in a hierarchy. And for you can, I could easily uh, uh, aggregate them. Now, one last thing I'm going to thing I'm going to show you here is that if I go over here, there were also, and this is frustrating, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. This confirmed U.S. Now, there's a reason why I had to bring in the U.S. states separately from uh, everybody else because they built a separate set of data for the U.S. by states. In the main table, the U.S. is doesn't have states, it's just the total. So in order to have the US by states, I removed US from the original files. I got rid of everything except US. You didn't see that in there in my function. And then in this function, I bring in all these tables that are just US by state. But there's something different here. The It has extra fields that I don't give a crap about. So I have to remove them. It has province and state as province underscore state, not province slash state as the other table. So I had to choose which one I wanted. So I changed the other one to province underscore state, and I leave this. I don't want country region. I just want country and both of them the same. I want to get rid of latitude, longitude, which in, in this case, longitude has an underscore. It's not even the same as in the other one. I don't give a crap about congine key. So in my code for this, if I go up here and I look at my queries, my get data function get data US is I just copied and pasted and fundamentally it's the same, but the function from the beginning, it changes. So when I say remove columns, I remove combined key UI, ISO, ISO 3, whatever. So you see what I'm doing is I'm actually adding value to my data inside my function, which is just a query, which was fed from a URL name that came from its parent caller, which in this case happens to be a query. It brings in the data. It made all these bespoke changes for the US, and then it brought them back to the original get data US. And so I end up with this, which will take a few seconds because it's bringing in a lot of data, right? Now, once I have these two, get data and get data US, I only have one other thing to do. I'm going to append them together. And that's the easiest thing in the world. All you need to do is say table.combine, get data US and get data. And you could do that in the, uh, in the in the URL as well, you can go. Uh, 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 actually, you go back out, and in here I can say get data here, and I can say append, or all right, and I can append uh, get data and get data US together to produce one table, which then gets dropped into my model, and ends up being these two hundred and some thousand records right now which is the whole world since the beginning of last year. And that is, I'm not finished yet, by the way. I'm almost finished, by the way, for those of you who are still asleep, have fallen asleep. This is the model of what I did. This is my date, country data other than US. This is US data by state, where I the query get data asks for the list of URLs, pass them one at a time to the function, which reached out to the internet and brought the data back. And then that data got pushed into the append table. Whoop, I did it again, my click-itis. And then this is US, it's the exact same thing. And it got back into append one. Clear as mud, right? I know you're all saying right. The fact of the matter is that this, this is brilliant what this does. And, we're querying a, a, a website to bring in, admittedly, it's something simple like CSVs, but a CSV then has to be manipulated and transformed into the proper format. And then once it's merged together with all the others, 
it, it gets transformed again. And then the result of those two sets of queries up here and down here get merged into one table. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is the, the my, is I do this all for free. So I'm getting a chance to show you something that I want you guys to think about. And I'm interested in finding people who are ready to test this. This is version two of our product called Excel Publish. Was this just an Excel add-in? Now I'm just going to quickly show you uh, what it what it does in this model. I have an, a, a ribbon called Excel Publish, and in it, in this same file, which this data all has been brought in using our one function, I am opening. Excel Publish, which is an add-in. This add-in has, I have selected various parts of this model to be exported directly to Power BI. What it does is it creates a, a staging file with the tables out of this data and publishes that data right to the Power BI uh, uh, server. What it does is stuff like this. It'll convert a pivot table to a regular table. Uh, it will handle, um, uh, regular tables, it will handle regular lists. It will also handle areas that are just ranges, either range names or just a set of cells that have no name. It will also pull in uh, dynamic arrays. But I've defined these in, the, in this, and then I'm gonna say send it to a target. And the target is my workspace on Power BI. I could choose not to do it. And the target file, which is your staging file is called this. All I'm going to do now is publish this, click at publish the data and click publish. Now this is this is the dangerous part. Uh, this has this has broken because of the virgin control between my two versions of Excel. Something I've always thought was a a risk, but this should work because it worked at 222 this afternoon. So it worked. what it's doing here is sucking out each one of the tables that I selected. And it's not just tables. Like I said, it could be pivot tables. It could be a range of cells. It could be a dynamic array. But as long as it's shaped like a table, we will suck the data out of it and publish that data. Yeah, I've added. I know. Go away. I'm almost done here, guys, by the way. This is the classic big finish. You notice how it created 238,000 records. Now it takes some time. Last time it took a minute and 23 seconds, but we're talking 238,000 records. Plus this is not the fastest virtual machine in the world. In fact, this is the cheapest virtual machine in the world. It's on Azure virtual machine, the cheapest one possible because I'm cheap. And so if you have a hotter machine, a dedicated machine or VM with uh, multiple processors of a higher quality pr uh, of performance, you're going to get this down to like 20 seconds, right? Because it's going to just fly. So if you're serious about this, you're going to want to have a fast computer. I'm sorry. And of course, you want as much RAM as you can get away with. But RAM is cheap, regardless of what they say. And now it has done all these records and it has completed publishing to my workspace. And let's prove it. I'm going to switch now all the way over here to my Mac. This is my Mac window and I, at Macintosh because all of my stuff is running in virtual machines on the Mac. You see, this was refreshed this morning. I'm going to go out of here or this afternoon and hit refresh. And this will now change to... And this doesn't take very long. 710, 708. So what happened is this data has now been refreshed as of two minutes ago. And if I go over here now, even though the data is the same because it's, it's January 18th, if I ran it tomorrow after midnight, it's going to bring in January 19th data. And all of this data then that is feeding this comes out of this file in Excel of which the biggest component consists of a set of function queries in, in Power Query that grab data from the, uh, the uh, URLs, transform them, merge them together and publish them. And that is an example of a 
FAS file, a big ass spreadsheet, but how you can use functions. And of course, guys, there, guys and gals, there's a bazillion ways to use this, as we know, but this is one way to do it. So let me conclude before we start opening it up. Power Query is awesome. I think I made that point earlier. You cannot do Power Query without custom functions. If you haven't been using custom functions, you aren't using Power Query to its biggest power. Power Query is not easy, but it's also not impossible, though. And in fact, I found 90% plus of Power Query was, oh, yeah, boom, boom, boom. That's easy. That makes sense. But, but I'm a database guy as well as being a spreadsheet guy. So maybe it was a little easy for me. But it's that last 10% that's the other 90%, you know, that classic. But every bit of effort you put into Power Query is going to make you a better spreadsheet developer. And you're going to be more efficient. You're going to be able to do more work, better work, more reliable work. Thank you for your time. And I am going to now give up my, uh, what I had and we can, you will see my face again, stop sharing and away we go. And I sure hope you guys heard this by the way. And I hope you recorded it, my, my friend. I hope too. <laughs> I was recording it. Yes, you were. It okay, says so. you're recording it. it says at the top. So. Well, then it better be. Okay, now where is, it's in here and it's here. Ah, there you are. And I'm going to share my, it's funny. It's Oh, there we are. And I'm back. So did I blow anybody's minds? Celia, did I blow your mind? It was a brilliant uh, system that you put in there. Um, Thank you. For, for the COVID report. But it's based on everything else I showed you, right? Yes, it's, it's, all, it's all staggered in its complexity. It's, um, it's interesting to see. It's beautiful because it's simple. It, it's, it seems simple <laughs> when after you explain it. Let me put you, let me bring this to the screen so that I well, can Well, we can talk about that. Anybody want it, it, to, it is simple. Once you've done a bunch of these, the power query isn't that hard. You know what the hardest part is? Is the data. First of all, figuring out the business logic of what you need to do, and then making cleaning your data. I believe Oz was on here at one time, and his big thing is cleaning data. Well, that's right. So what we're doing is we're cleaning the data inside um, Power Query as it's passing through right? Which is pretty darn cool. And the other thing I didn't show you guys, by the way, is that each of those queries that I created in the COVID, the functions and the main queries were connection only. I did not bring the subordinate results into the data model or into the spreadsheet. When I appended them at the end, then I dropped the appended query into the spreadsheet just the final result set. So I don't have uh, all these stages of data in worksheets or even in the data model or even in Power Query inside the model. So the model is not huge, right? And it's gonna be more efficient, it's gonna be quicker. And it's less likely to gack, all right? Yeah. So I got 36 left. I started with 43 or four. So that's pretty good. Most people stopped, hung in. Yeah, some people had to leave. Uh, it was a little, a little oh, bit of the course. presentation, but, uh, but uh, a lot of people stayed around. Uh, someone was asking about recurring recursive functions. Have you thought of that or tried that? So a, a function calling, calling itself and itself and itself as many times as, as needed. Yeah, you could do that, but you have to have an out, <laughs> right? So you'd have to have a question in there uh, that says, at what point am I finished, right? So yeah, you could do recursive functions, I suppose. Functions within functions. Like, but I, uh, I can't think of an example of where I would do like that. Like we are we are saying, uh, seeing now some people publishing uh, using the Lambda function 
So, for example, if you want to. Oh, things like the uh, interest on uh, owner's equity kind of for stuff, example, you mean? Yeah, you OK. Uh, yeah, own. that's where land is going to be awesome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, but you could use it for this, too. Yeah. If you set a threshold, you say, I only want to do it five rounds. You know, you could do that in, in your function. Right, and that every every time it comes around, is it, it adds one, two, three, four, five. Good. That's as close as it gets. That's the classic spreadsheet bugaboo, right? That's why they built the ability to. The, Excel had a whole bunch of capability built into it in the original Excel. It's still baked in there, to specifically for that thing. But I I would think that for a lot of the things I just did in Power Query, by the way, Lambda is the exact same thing. Don't forget that. It's the exact same thing. The only difference is, in fact, Lambda has the whole thing. It has the let and everything. It has yeah. the ability to receive the very, it is the exact same thing as this Power Query, but it's based on cells in the spreadsheet. What we're doing is we're applying the logic to data uh, that's being uh, use. So, for example, if you're doing table-oriented uh, augmentation of fields, you might want to use Lambda in the functions in the future uh, rather than using Power Query on a column, right? But your Lambda, of course, isn't going to do your table your queries and stuff like that, right? So, but Lambda is the greatest thing since Power Query, let's put it that way, right? That's been added to Excel. And I assume everybody else agrees with that. That's here. It's if, if anyone want to wants to ask some question, make a comment, turn on their videos, their mics. Feel free yeah, to do come so. aboard, gang. Vivek, let us know if there are any other questions. I don't answer questions as a rule. Oh, you don't answer <laughs> questions. We didn't. We didn't sign that contract like that. I'm going to tell you a question that I don't want you to ask. Uh, okay. Don't ask me about the global parameters in Power Query because that's a whole story in itself. The parameters that I'm showing, showed here today, are the same as the global parameters. They're just localized parameters. I personally like that rather than having global parameters that I can use here and there and there. I'd like my own parameters built inside my process so that it's related to my process. It's a bit of a chicken or the egg thing. But the other thing is, if you're going to use the global parameters, it opens a whole can of worms that is a, a presentation in itself, if I might add. And maybe somebody else could do better than me at that. But I personally grow my own parameters, you know. Um, Go ahead. What about Power Query queries protection? I think you mentioned something at that at some point. Do you know a way of protecting avoiding them? someone to, if you pass the file to someone, is there yeah, a way to yeah. avoid them to peek into your queries? Let's see, developer. Okay, data, sorry about that. Uh, protection. Everything moves around here. Protect workbook, boom, okay. Uh, boom function. Yeah, okay, uh, let me share my screen. It's actually fairly simple. Let me share my screen. And this is something a lot of people don't even realize exists. And that sort of upsets me because it's so fundamental. Are we back over here? Yeah. Okay. When I go right mouse, you'll notice how I cannot get access to these queries. Right? They're locked. They're grayed out. Right? The reason for that is because I protected the workbook. So if I go unprotect the Can workbook. Can we refresh all? Excuse me? Can we refresh while it's locked? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Lock only locks uh, people getting in and being nosy. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you don't, I can prove it right here. Okay, it's locked. Oh, I got to, I got to lock the workbook, not the worksheet, right? It's the whole freaking workbook. The, you so need now to, it's all you great. Need to unprotect, do you need to unprotect the worksheet because? Yeah, in some cases, yeah. It yeah. doesn't refresh queries on protected worksheets. That's right. But it will protect, refresh them on protected workbooks. 
So you see here it is, it's, it's, it's refreshing. So you're right, which again is a, another reason for using Power Query uh, or, uh, or ultimately uh, using uh, Lambda as well. Is it, well, no, Lambda is the same, even though Lambda formula has been reduced, it's all like, like tiny URL, these tiny formulas. Um, you still could stomp on your logic in a, in, a, in a Lambda formula embedded in a spreadsheet. But if you have a worksheet like this, and all your logic is done up in Power Query, you see how it's locked still, uh, then it refreshed no problem. Then you don't have any, any formulas here for the user to step on. Here's a good example, by the way. You see this here? I made a very small change. It took like 30 seconds to change my week to be the year and the week. Because when I started it, I just said week, thinking to myself, well, this isn't going to last into 21. 21. And guess what? It has, right? All right. So it was really simple. That's just another point. But let me show you again what I did. I went to, uh, uh, it moves around here, uh, protect workbook, right? And then I just unprotected the workbook. And now I can see it. But if you, and, and, and this is the other thing, guys, if you, uh, if you put in a, a, a password on the protection of the workbook, then you've, uh, you've got the, uh, you're, you got it down. In fact, you should always put protection on the on the workbook. Always, always, always. And I often put protection on worksheets. Uh, but sometimes you just can't avoid it. And this is the classic is that I have spent 35 years building spreadsheets for other people to use. And that is a whole unique set of skills. Um, if you're building them for yourself, that's a totally different animal, right? And so protection, the funniest thing is that Microsoft officially doesn't want to encourage you using protection in a workbook because it's not um, really protection. It's not uh, uh, decrypt, encrypted and all that crap, right? Therefore, they say, they really told me openly. He told me at a conference, we don't want people, we don't want to encourage people to use protection. And I go, that's crap because it's good enough protection, <laughs> right? Okay. It's better than nothing protection. And if somebody goes and figures out how to unlock a protected workbook, they've got too much time on their hands, right? And like I said, you should tell their boss and get them fired because they're working against the uh, uh, the correctness of this document. And we all know that Excel has got to be correct because there's a lot of people who don't want Excel around. And so any excuse, like speaking of COVID, right, in the UK, any excuse to, to, uh, to, to diss Excel in corporations, is they go for it. So we got to be accurate. We got to be secure. Yeah. Any other questions? But as long as as we protect the the the, the structure and and the connections between formulas and sheets and all that, that's what is important to protect yeah. the work. But some people that just think it's uh, they are so smart going in and <laughs> unprotect it and then change something to their will, not. Um, not knowing what the damage they could do by doing that. Cause well, then that. you use protection with a password. And if somebody figures it out, you have to have a an original version of it. And if it breaks, the first thing you have to do is see if anybody cracked your password. Because if it cracked your password, they're not going to put it back in. Yeah. Um, they're not yeah. going to. They're not going to be sloppy. Yeah. And you can go in and figure it out and tell the client, well, your boy came in and he got too cute and he broke it and you lost $5 million. I'm sorry. You know, you don't have to touch my errors and admissions insurance at all. Right. I mean, I the other thing, Celia, I find that in today's world, less people go in and mess around in spreadsheets than used to. So there you go. That's just what I find. They're too busy doing their job. 